Good morning, everyone. It is good to see each one of you here this morning. Our annual Super Bowl of Caring officially underway. I know because my ladle is here. Our ladle is here. The Church of the Palms ladle is here. And we want to keep it right here. So the boxes are out in the narthex ready to accept your cans of soup, ramen, any size, any brand. The more the merrier. And uh, it is a friendly competition. I must keep reminding myself, uh, us of that. And uh, with, with United Church of Sun City. So let's pull out all the stops of our generosity and keep that soup coming on in. On page two, there is an announcement in your order of worship today in the lower right-hand corner entitled, Did You Know? It explains all about the ways you can access classes or meetings or worship services that have happened either in the most recent weeks or way in the past, if you would like. There are so many ways to attend and participate. If you have questions, please call the office, Nikki, or I can help walk you through any of the ways. Go out there and subscribe to the church's YouTube channel. Uh, you can't get enough of the Church of the Palms worship services. You want to keep hearing those jokes and that music over and over again. Uh, it'll be for your listening pleasure, I'm sure. On page four of the order of worship, you will see several opportunities for learning offered by our lifelong learning team. The Enneagrams class continues on Wednesdays from the 17th of January through the 7th of February. Living the Questions class, which will be led by Reverend David Klingensmith, begins Wednesday, February 21st. So plenty of time to mark it on your calendar and clear your uh, schedule so that you can attend that. Look for more information as we head into February. And then beginning February 27th, the Palestine Human Rights Team will offer three classes as a follow-up to our recent study we completed during Advent based on the book, The First Advent in Palestine by Kelly Nikondeha. Um, there will be more information about that in the coming weeks as well. Finally, there is a scam email circulating from someone trying to impersonate Pastor Paul Whitlock. Can you imagine? I mean, that would be a miracle to impersonate Pastor Whitlock. But nonetheless, this email asks for you to uh, send gift cards and all sorts of fun things. Please delete it. Just delete it. Remember that none of our staff will ever make any requests like this, ever. Uh, if we have fundraisers, or, or we need money, we usually do it from right there. Sometimes we do it up here, but right there is where it happens. So uh, just double check your texts and email messages carefully. If it sounds weird or weirder than usual, <laughs> it probably is, and go ahead and delete it anyway. That and all the other information is in the order of worship for your participation here at the Church of the Palms. Pastor Paul. Oh my, oh my. We do welcome you to the Church of the Palms. We don't always take ourselves seriously, but we do take caring for others and our ministry seriously. I'm Pastor Paul. You've met Pastor Jim. We've got Jen helping us this morning and Dr. Terry and Elaine. And we're just grateful that you're here on this Martin Luther King weekend. And how appropriate that we're talking about peace, about dreamers, I want to give you permission, it's okay to daydream in church this morning. As if I could ever stop that. <laughs> but it's not okay to sleepwalk. That is, you got to stay awake this morning, especially during the call to worship. That's your teaser. That's your clue. You're going to have to just stay awake. We choose to dream with our eyes open. And when we do, great things happen. Special welcome to our LGBTQ plus siblings and all who are tired of hate. To have peace in this world, in our nation, in our state, 
in our community, in our church, and within us as individuals, we're going to need to make wise choices. You've already made one today. You've laughed at my jokes. <laughs> no, I mean, you're here. That's what I meant. You're here. We're grateful for your presence this day. In our words and in our deeds, let's worship God together. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. I invite you to join me in our responsive call to worship. Dr. King's work reminds us church and state must work together for the common good. Laws must establish justice for all, but hearts must change for the beloved community to flourish. We will, we do, will the do the work, work of, of justice, justice for all. all. We will we open our hearts to an ever-expanding ever vision, vision of community. We will we trust, trust the, the Spirit, Spirit of, of God, God to guide and, and move us between, between the present and, and the anticipated realm of justice. justice. You are our God. Be gracious to your children, for we cry out to you all day long. Bring joy to the souls of your servants. For to you, O oh God, we lift up our soul. Dr. King's vision inspires us. We are tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We will, we will work, work for, for the world, world where lives are enriched by difference, difference where, where people, people of different, different genders, races, races and sexual, sexual orientations, orientations work together, together in shalom, shalom 
for the, the good, good of the whole. Of the whole. We, will we will work for the for nation, nation where persons, persons will be judged solely on the content of their characters. For you, O God, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O God, to the prayers of the marginalized. Listen to our supplications. Dr. King's words challenge us. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We will, we will listen, listen to the, to the cries, cries of the poor. We, we will stand in solidarity with those who suffer oppression. We will take as our own the hopes of all who long for full human life. We will, we will create in our midst the beloved community with room for all, justice for all, joy for all, shalom for all. We will listen to the voice of Christ, who stirs about liberating all minds, hearts, and spirits. In our days of trouble, we call on you, for you will answer us. There is none like you among the gods, O God, nor are there any works like yours to the ends of the earth. Teach us your way, O God, that you and we may walk together in your truth. Dr. King's life inspires us. I still believe that one day humanity will bow before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant over war and bloodshed and non-violent redemptive goodwill will proclaim the rule of the land, I still believe that someday we shall overcome. We will overcome because our faith and trust in God, we will reach the goal laid before us without faltering. We will never give up our hope for equality for one another. We will live Dr. King's dream into our reality. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in our first hymn, This Is My Song.
In our spiritual readings section of worship, we present different quotes from a variety of people and perspectives. Today, however, we focus on quotes from the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And finally, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, and tireless exertions, and passionate concern of dedicated individuals.
I am reading from the message, starting at Genesis 37, verse 18. I picked this particular passage because it is, for me, a, a classic example of what humans want to do to dreamers. It begins, Joseph's brothers spotted him off in the distance, and by the time they got to them, he got to them, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. The brothers were saying, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these old cisterns. We can say that a, a vicious animal ate him up. We'll see what his dreams amount to. Reuben convinces his other brothers not to kill him. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off his fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him, threw him into a dry cistern. Judah said, brothers, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. His brothers agreed and sold him for 20 pieces of silver. They took Joseph's coat, butchered a goat, dipped the goat in blood. They took the fancy coat back to their father and said, oh, we found this. Do you think this is your son's coat? Jacob tore his clothes in grief and mourned his son a long, long time. He refused comfort. In Egypt, the Midianites told Joseph, sold Joseph to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, manager of his household affairs. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. But the dreamer's story continued. A cliff note version of that in the following chapters of Genesis is we learn that Joseph was thrown into jail under false charges, is released, and rises to power in government. His brothers become, because of the, the, the famine, are forced to come and grovel at his feet. He, review, he re reveals his true identity and then is reunited with his father. That's, that's the story of that dreamer. Today we're going to focus on another dreamer. But first, will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth... The meditations of all of our hearts, the thoughts, the minds, the actions of our lives be acceptable in thy sight, O love, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it was the biggest speech of his career, and he knew it. Martin Luther King Jr. was already widely recognized as a spiritual leader of the American Civil Rights Movement. The podium set up in front of the Lincoln Memorial, August 28, 1963, would be his biggest pulpit ever. Multitudes had journeyed to the nation's capital to join the March on Washington, co-organized by the NAACP, the SCLC. The eyes of the nation were on the keynote speaker. Dr. King had carefully prepared his text. He'd asked for suggestions from his trusted advisors. He'd gone through several handwritten manuscripts, unusual for him, because he rarely used speechwriters and often spoke extemporaneously from only a few notes. Originally, his title had been called Normalcy, Never Again. But by the time he, he'd finished multiple edits, the papers that he clutched in his hand just were not what he wanted them to be. The most famous line from the speech, I have a dream, wasn't written on paper. 
That ringing refrain had been a feature of speeches he, he delivered in other places, most notably the Booker T. Washington High School nearly a year earlier and in Detroit two months previously. The beloved gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, she was sitting behind Dr. King as he struggled to find words to connect with the audience. Tell him about the dream, Martin, she called out to him. He heard her, and so he did. He told us all about a dream. Dr. Fra Dr. King's phrase, I have a dream, has gone down in history. The most famous of those improvised lines is this. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the, character, the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. His sermon continues. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places made plain, the crooked places made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Words straight from the prophet Isaiah, quoted by the most significant Christian prophet of that time. Dr. King continued, this is our hope. This is the faith that I will go back to the South with. This is the faith I will be able to you out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. A recent poll of more than 100 scholars of public addresses ranked Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech as the most significant speech of the 20th century. High praise when you consider Reagan's tear down this wall, JFK's we choose to go to the moon, and FDR's a day that will live in infamy. Now, not everyone liked the speech at the time. An FBI agent, head of the Bureau's domestic spying operations, wrote this memo to Director J. Edgar Hoover. Quote, in the light of King's powerful demagogic speech yesterday, he stands head and shoulders above all other Negro leaders put together when it comes to influencing great masses of Negroes. We must mark him now, if we have not done so before, as the most dangerous Negro of the future in this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro, and national security." End quote. Whew. King was a dreamer. And as a dreamer, things didn't go well for him. Nevertheless, he still had the heart and courage to dream. Then, as now, dreamers make the powers that be, the powers that fear change, <clears throat> deeply uncomfortable. Visionary leaders do not fear to, visionary leaders do not fear to dream of a better tomorrow <clears throat> for all of God's children. They do it anyway. As a consequence, those who, who fear change sometimes do desperate things to try to bury the dream. The Bible tells us that Joseph not only had one dream, but he had several dreams, and they extended over his lifetime. His early dreams foreshadowed a time when his family would bow to him, his, his dream it was his dream, and he was not afraid to share it with his 11 brothers. It was a dream that predicted that he will not only rule over them one day, but also save them. And his brothers respond, oh, here comes that dreamer. Come now, let's, let's kill him and throw him into a cistern. We'll see what becomes of his dreams. <laughs> the huh was added by me. 
Of course, we know how that story turns out. We can say a lot of things about Joseph. Good and not so good. The one thing I will say about Joseph is he was not a complainer. He was a dreamer. Reflecting on Dr. King's speech, Jim Wallace of Washington, D.C. Sojourner Community makes this point. Looking at the speech, he observed that there was something missing in Dr. King's speech. Something was missing. It was the phrase, I have a complaint. <laughs> Wallace continues, there was much to complain about for black Americans and there is much to complain about today for many in this nation. But King taught us that our complaints or or, or critiques, or even our dissent, will never be the foundation of social movements that will change the world. But dreamers always will. Just saying what's wrong will never be enough to change. We have to lift up a vision of what is right. Could there be a better lesson for us to teach our children and our grandchildren? We need to encourage them to choose to dream and to dream big, not complain. Dream big, as Dr. King and so many other great prophets have. We need to teach them to dream justice for all of God's children. We need to teach them to dream not so much the American dream of individual achievement, but to dream God's dream for humanity, a dream of a world made new through love, not hate. It's a dream expressed by the Apostle Paul who writes to the Corinthians, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything is has become new. That's 1 Corinthians 5.17. We need more people choosing to be dreamers like that. We don't need complainers. There's a whole culture of complaint that threatens to drown us all in its bitter swill. Think, think of the last gathering where people were complaining. Maybe the complaints were something trivial, transitory, like the boss's unreasonable demands, the call of a referee, the length of line at the checkout stand, or maybe they were about larger matters, an entire political process, the editorial position of a TV network, or the way our economy continues to step on the poor and the middle class. Once at a national meeting of college student services professionals, college student services professionals, a dean, a distinguished dean of students was leading a workshop talking about things he'd learned on the job, things he'd learned, he was remarking on the fact that wherever you go in America higher education, there's one gripe, one complaint you're certain to hear from the student body. It's about the food in the dining hall. As a man whose job it was to make life better for students, he shared how over the years he convened many committees to improve the quality of of dining hall food. Those committees polled the student body, found out what they wanted and needed, made improvements. The food got better and better. Yet over the years, the dean observed a strange phenomenon, one in which I think is mirrored at our care facilities in Sun City. The students never stopped complaining about the food. Quote, I have a theory of why that is, he explained to his colleagues. 
when a group of students comes together from all over the country, from many different income levels, ethnic backgrounds, religious creeds, those who are majoring in everything from poetry to organic chemistry, there's one common topic of interest that can raise, that a student can raise with any other. It's sure to get a sympathetic hearing. It's the subject of how bad the food is in the dining hall. It doesn't even have to be bad for the students to complain about it, he went on, because it's not about the food. It's about the deeply felt human need for community. Last fall, I read a, a study from Harvard that polled retirees, recent retirees, and it listed a lack of community, a loss of community as the number one complaint. You lose your friends that you had at your work. A culture of complaint is a quick and dirty way to build community. Citizens make strident speeches about everything that's wrong and needs to be fixed. And as they do so, they feel, the, they feel the thrill of people coming together around a common cause. But it's a false unity. A sense of unity built on complaint has no staying power. At the end of the day, it fails to satisfy. It only builds negativity. We don't need more complainers today in this nation or in churches. We need dreamers. People who are making an intentional choice to be visionaries. Who focus not on how bad things are, but how, on how good they can be. We need dreamers who can outline concrete ways, small incremental steps to achieve worthy goals. Just one dreamer can sow seeds of joyous enthusiasm that will transform and remake community life. T.E. Lawrence, the famed Lawrence of Arabia, had this to say about those who dream. Quote, all people dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty resources of their mind awake to find it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous people, that they may act their dreams with open eyes, to make it possible. We need more dreamers of the day just like that. We need people who are passionate, who refuse to accept the cynical comments as reality and dare to fill the world with righteousness, transformation, and possibility. We in the church need to be about the business of raising up godly dreamers. For in these famous words often attributed to anthropologist Margaret Mead, quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Those who have accomplished such a feat were dreamers, one and all. May we seek out such dreamers wherever we find them, even among ourselves. And may we encourage and equip them to pursue that contagious dream of a new creation through God. May it be so for you and for me. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
as we come to our prayer time together today, you're going to want to get out a pencil because I have many, many additions to our prayer list today. Please pray for the family of Hank Grady. Hank is uh, Suzanne Beauclair's brother, and he passed away during the last few days. So pray for the Grady and Beauclair families. Pray for Pat Clark and her family. She's been attending here, been very busy and active around the church, and she has some significant uh, issues in her family going on right now. Please pray for her. Victoria McWilliams had eye surgery in this last week, and she's having a little bit of a challenge to get back to where she would like to be, so pray for Victoria. Pray for Ruth Emanuel. Ruth is in the hospital as we speak with some infection and overall not feeling well. That girl has just keeps on ticking, got more energy than most of us, so it's got to be significant. Ray and Judy, we're glad you're back. And we continue to pray for Ray and Judy Larson as they heal from loss. This coming Saturday, 11 o'clock in this sanctuary, we will celebrate the life of the Reverend Clint Reynolds. So come and be a part of that and continue to pray for that family as well. I told you, you would need your pencil. Also throughout the building, there are prayer cards. And any time you would like for the pastors to pray for you or you would like to be added to the prayer list for whatever the reason is, you can write that down as the offering plate is passed or there is a basket here at the front. Please feel free and encouraged and know that we are praying for you. Let's go to God in prayer. With gratitude for the gift of Jesus Christ, our advocate, let us breathe in the Spirit and draw near to our loving God. Holy and loving God, thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for calling us to be your disciples, your prophets, your teachers, your servants, your saints, and even fools. Thank you for using simple words to reveal profound truths. Help us to do the same as we share your word with those who feel they have no hope, no direction, no one to talk with them, to be present in their pain. God, fill this church and the church universal with your spirit so it heeds Jesus' call to follow in love, to speak in love, to act always in love. Bless this congregation as we seek to do your work in this community. Keep us steadfast in faith. Use us to bring light and justice to all within our midst. 
we remember with gratitude the life, the words, the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you for raising him up as your servant. Help us to honor him and glorify you by finding good and gracious ways to extend the blessings of liberty, justice, and equality to all people. Shine the light of your wisdom into the hearts of earthly leaders. Teach them your ways. Take all wickedness from them and use them to establish your ways among all people. Help us to live in peace with our neighbors Help us to show honor and kindness and mercy. Send the power of your Holy Spirit into the hearts of all who suffer, and especially those we have named this morning and those who are within our hearts. Fill them with health and hope. Bless all who minister to them. Merciful God, thank you for your servants who have now followed you from this life into the next and now abide in your presence. Grant that we too may live in such a way that we will establish your kingdom here on earth. It is in the name of the one who taught us to pray these words, Jesus Christ who said, our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you to one and all for sharing your time, talent, and treasure. It takes all of us doing our part. I wanted to let you know that the Church of the Palms received an estate gift from D. Crawl. Some of you might remember her, especially in the choir. She's been gone a couple years, but she loved our music program, sang in the choir. She was a retired teacher and pig farmer. Now that's a combination you probably hadn't thought of unless you're a teacher and then you go, oh, yeah, that, that kind of fits. That kind of fits. I guess there's not much difference between slopping pigs and, well, we won't go there. She remembered many charities in her will. The Church of the Palms received $38,000 this week. That gift is yet to be designated. It will be at some point. Much of the fun stuff that we're able to do, from solar panels to a shower trailer to a piece of art, came about because someone wanted the Church of the Palms to be alive right now, but also in the future beyond their own life here. However you choose to share your blessings this day, we're grateful. Sharing is a key component to peace. May there be peace in our offerings. Ushers, would you come forward? Holy One, give us dreams of peace, ways to bring about peace locally and globally. May these gifts of time, talent, and treasure inspire peace to be lived. Amen. Well, looky what I found. <laughs> and you know what this means. Or maybe you don't. Sometimes it means pumpkin pie, but today it means hot chocolate, marshmallows, little uh, peppermint sprinkles, and of course, some whipped cream. So that happens at Fellowship Hall right after this blessing. So my fellow dreamers, let us stand to our feet and receive this blessing. As we depart and go from this place, both individually and collectively, be who you are called to be in any and all ways you can.
seek justice, resist evil, stand strong against death and all of death's works. Add your voice, move your feet, extend your hands, hold on to that long arc of history like your life depends on it because it may very well. Pull with as much or as little strength as you have so that together we might help it continue to bend in the direction of justice and peace and hope and promise for you and for me, for us and for them, for all of God's children. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us sing.